Okay, here we're going to be looking at molecules and bonds. I see a couple examples presented here. Now, when I say the word bonds, we're not talking about James Bond. We're not talking about Barry Bond. We're not talking about municipal bonds. We're talking about, of course, chemical bonds. So what are chemical bonds? Bonds with incomplete valence shells can share or transfer valence electrons with certain other atoms forming these chemical bonds. The formation and function of molecules depend on the chemical bonding between atoms. Two main classifications are going to be covalent bonds, where we see these electrons being shared, and ionic bonds, where electrons are being transferred. So let's start with ionic bonds. Atoms sometimes take electrons f um, from their bonding partners, as we see in this animation. An example is a transferred electron from a sodium uh, to chlorine. You see your sodium being transferred over. Both atoms have charges, and a charged atom or molecule is called an ion. You see a positive and a negative here being drawn together. Now these ions, remember we call a positively charged ion a cation, and a negatively charged ion an anion. And as a result, an ionic bond is an attraction between an anion and a cation. Attraction between a positive and a negative ion here. And that's occurring because we're moving electrons. So keep in mind, and remember, electrons have a negative charge. When we transfer them, we're also moving not only the electron, but the charge, and the negative charge at that. So we see that depicted here. Compounds formed by ionic bonds are called ionic compounds, or salts. Probably the one we're most familiar with here is sodium chloride, which is table salt. And it's often found in nature as crystals, and as a result of a metal and a non-metal combining. Metal and a non-metal combining. So we see here, sodium losing that electron, creating a positive charge. Chlorine here, gaining an electron, gaining that negative charge, and that positive-negative forming this bond that's forming called an ionic bond. Now what that actually looks like is ionic substances tend to form crystalline lattices rather than distinctive molecules. So if you've ever looked really, really closely at salt, you'll actually see these little, what looks like little like boxes or cubes that occur. This is a crystal lattice. It's because our sodium and our chlorides fit very neatly together. If you go back and look at previous lectures, we see what happens to the atomic radius of cations and anions, and it helps you understand why these fit so neatly together. The other form that I mentioned was called covalent bonds. This is the sharing of a pair of valence electrons by two atoms. In a covalent bond, the shared electrons count as part of each atom's valence shell. They're being shared, not transferred, shared, so it can count in both of these particular hydrogen atoms. How does that look? We're looking at our molecules now. So a molecule consists of two or more atoms held together by a covalent bond. A single covalent bond or single bond is the sharing of one pair of valence electrons. Remember this line, there's an electron represented here and here. We just kind of connect them together. And a double covalent bond or double bond is the sharing of two pairs of valence electrons, as we see here between these two carbons. It's double bond. Between this carbon and this hydrogen, we have a single bond that's forming. Now, structural versus molecular formula. The notation used to represent atoms in bonding is called the structural formula. The structural formula. That's represented here. It depicts the structure, how those atoms are organized. Pretty simple when it's only two hydrogens. This can be abbreviated further to the, what we call the molecular formula. That example here is just H2. So here we also see an example of the structural formula. And then down here we see the molecular formula. All of these are representing the same thing. Here's the big black circle. Here's carbon with four hydrogens. Here's our two oxygens and two oxygens, forming carbon dioxide and two water molecules. So we could say they're essentially telling the same story, but depicting it in different ways. Compound is a combination of two or more different elements. So covalent bonds can form between atoms of the same element or atoms of different elements. And we see that located here with our carbon binding to our hydrogen carbon bond to um, other carbons, these we will assume are hydrogens. This gets very important when we start looking at structure and shape and macromolecules. So this is kind of just that understanding of what's going on at the molecular level here. So these compounds, a compound is a substance consisting of two or more elements in a fixed ratio. A compound is characteristics different from those of its elements. So we have carbon and hydrogen, carbon has its properties, Hydrogen has its properties. When we combine them, we may get different properties. It's probably most obvious here with sodium chloride that we're also sodium chloride that we're also familiar with. 
Sodium itself is actually this kind of gray looking shiny metal. Chlorine, in this case the chlorine gas, is extremely deadly and has this yellowish, almost greenish like look to that. And when we combine these two together, we get sodium chloride, table salt, which we've all had. Uh, we all have inside, that's very important. So sodium looks very different than chlorine, looks very different than sodium chloride. So this is an example of how combining these atoms together can form very different properties. Essential elements for life. About 25 of the 92 elements are essential for life. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen make up 96% of living matter. Most of the remaining 4% consists of calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. What's left, though, is what we call trace elements. Those are required by an organism in very small quantities. We see here an example of some trace elements. So magnesium would be an example of, a, of an element in a very small percentage. Trace is less than 1%, and magnesium can kind of fall into that category, but zinc, selenium, iron, iodine, chromium, boron, these are all trace elements. Essential for life, but still needed in very small amounts. We have certain things called nonpolar covalent bonds. So covalent bonds is sharing, but nonpolar means atoms are shared, share the electron equally. We see that here, like think of tug of wear on tug of war and everyone's pulling equally. No real favoritism here. Everything is being shared equally. That'd be a nonpolar covalent bond. In contrast to that, think of a polar covalent bond where the atoms do not share them equally. Here we have the same tug of war example where we're getting pulled in one direction. One atom is what was called more electronegative. That means it can has a stronger affinity, stronger ability to pull electrons towards it. This results in an unequal sharing of electrons. And this will cause what we call partially positive and partially negative charge to each molecule. So we see here our big oxygen pulling in the electrons, creating these weak negative charges, resulting in these weak positive charges. Because these electrons are being pulled closer to it, this molecule here of oxygen takes on these slightly negative charges here. As a result, this area here, these electrons are pulled away from it. Protons here have a slightly weakly positive charge here very important for the properties of water. Continuing on this concept of electronegativity, it's an atom's attraction for the electrons of a covalent bond. The more electronegative an atom, the more strongly it pulls shared electrons towards itself. The most electronegative of atoms here is fluorine, and the least is francium. So we see this general trend as we work our way up and to the right, the greater electronegativity atoms are located here and these are weaker. So it kind of gives you an idea of the trend within the periodic table. Now what's called a dipole is polar bonding between atoms produces a polar molecule or polar's unequal sharing which has areas with slightly positive or slightly negative charges. We see that here. Here's our oxygen, slightly negative, there are slightly positive charges here. This creates a dipole where there's a concentrated positive charge separated from a concentrated negative charge. Hydrogen bonds. A hydrogen bond forms when hydrogen atoms covalently bond to one um, electronegative atom is also attracted to another electronegative atom. In living cells, electronegative patterns are usually oxygen or nitrogen atoms. The hydrogen bonding that, that joins water molecules are weak, so only about 1 20th as strong as a covalent bond. So while they are bonds, but they're very weak bonds. We see that represented with these lines here. We have a weak negative, a weak po po positive. But as a result, our hydrogens are going to have this bond forms we call hydrogen bond. We represent with the lines because it's pretty easily broken, but it does kind of stick together for a little bit. So we have something called van der Waals interactions. If electrons are distributed asymmetry in a molecule or atoms, this can result in hot spots of positive and negative charges. These van der Waals interactions are interactions between molecules that are close together as a result of these charges. And geckos kind of use this as their ability to stick to walls and ceilings because of these particular interactions that occur. So we see a little close up here. Collectively, such interactions can be strong because there's a lot of surface area here, a lot of opportunities for these van der Waal interactions to occur. And this is because of the toe hairs. This is what allows geckos to cling or kind of stick to wall or ceiling surfaces, allowing them to run up that area. Dipole-dipole interactions, these are partial positive and negative charges. 
molecules orient themselves with positive being attracted to negative charges we see here. Kind of like, think about almost like a magnet. And this occurs in hydrogen bonding. Also occurs in ions, um, it can be induced, and also hydrogen bonding. Lastly, weak chemical bonds. Most of the strongest bonds in an organism are covalent bonds. Uh, ionic bonds are, have the strongest bond energy. We see our way that we're working down the lineup here. Weak chemical bonds, such as hydrogen bonds and van der Waals, are also important because they reinforce shapes and adhere molecules together. So while these are weaker bonds, don't think that they're necessarily less important. They're very important when we start thinking about protein folding, which is important for enzymes, which is important for structure determining function. The way a protein folds will impact its function. The way it folds may be dependent on hydrogen bonds. Even though they're weaker than ionic and covalent, they still are very important. Hopefully that was a nice general quick overview of molecules and bonds.